Do you want to know how you can use sales to either retire early, become financially independent, or just leverage it to live a bigger, huge life? Then this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have Adam Carroll. He is the host of Build a Bigger Life Podcast. He is the author of Winning the Money Game, and that is exactly what we're talking about today's show, essentially how we can win financially over the short, medium, and long term. We go crazy deep in this episode. We get into early retirement, financial independence. We get into just living a bigger life through investments, strategy, and a whole lot more. And so, without that said, let's jump straight in. Adam, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with you. You're more than welcome, sir. I'm excited to have you on. And I want to lead and open this interview with a crazy open-ended question. And I hope you don't think I'm being lazy here. It's open-ended for a purpose because I've got my views on how the audience should spend some of their money. You are the experts. So you have the legitimate <laughs> view on this. Um, and I've polled the audience in the past. The Getting rid of the people hugely either side of this, they're bringing in B2B salespeople, they're bringing in between 80 and 150 grand a year. So something along those lines. It comes in spits and spats, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, whether our commissions are kind of yearly, monthly, quarterly as deal comes in. So perhaps this muddies the water a little bit of how we budget, how we spend our money, how we invest it. But given that data set, and again, open-ended because I don't want to put any words in your mouth and I don't want to lead things in one direction or the other. How should we be thinking about that cash and how should we be starting to leverage at least some of it, if not most of it, some of it to lead a bigger life further down the line for where we are right now? Well, I think the um, th it is a, a very well positioned, open-ended question, Will. So thank you for asking <laughs> it. Um, I think, you know, there's probably a, several different answers. The one that, that comes to the top for me is that people who are in a commission sales job where the money does come, you know, when it when it rains, it pours kind of uh, kind of situation. And I've been in a business for a very long time where there is feast and there is famine and you're planting seeds. And, you know, how many analogies can we plug in here? But um, one of the things that became really important for me and my family in being in this lifestyle was deciding that we had a set income level that we were going to live by. And if that is your salary or that's your salary plus 20 percent of your commission or whatever it may be, decide that you're going to live at that level for the foreseeable future. And my grandparents always gave me this great piece of advice. They said, live on last year's income. And I took it another step forward and said, I'm going to live on two years ago income so that my income is always outpacing what my lifestyle is. And when you do that, it becomes easier and easier to put away 20 and 30 and 40 percent of your your revenue on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, I I can imagine that some of your listeners may bristle at the thought of having to scale back some of their lifestyle choices. Um, and I'm I by no means want someone to say, well, but I love my BMW. I don't want to I'm, I'm not going to drive this anymore. I'm going to trade it in for a Camry. I'm not necessarily saying that. Um, you know, I loved the BMW that I drove for a long time and it actually made me feel better as a salesperson. So I'm a, I'm a fan of making those choices if they, they fit your budget and they fill you up. But I think deciding that there's this income level we're going to stay at, and then anything that you make above that needs to be used in a very strategic way. And we'll probably get into how we use that here in a little bit. So we've covered a lot of ground here already and we'll definitely get into the overflow of income and what we should, shouldn't be doing with that. I'm, I've been a good, up, up, it's funny, we would have this conversation a month ago, I would have been a great example of this, of I saved, before I left my sales role to start the podcast, regular listeners will know this, but I'll, I'll quickly fill you in, Adam, I saved 12 months money, I had 12 months kind of do or die of creating a business, the salesman podcast, and everything else that we do came out the back of that, and I've lived, um, I, I don't want to kind of go too deep into the, because the, the, there's obviously, um, the personal side of it and the business side of it, the income. I'm a sole trader, so it's all kind of tied together. So I don't want to go too deep into it. But last year, I lived on about 1,500 quid a month. And I threw the, and so this is where it gets a bit squirrely. I threw the business, I traveled around the world, we did loads of live events, we did loads of cool stuff. Um, my kind of lifestyle probably didn't dip that much. And the amount that I was going out, the amount of, time and money I was spending on going for nice meals and things like this, buying new clothes, all that kind of stuff. Didn't really dip from when I worked in sales, 
But when I worked in sales, I'd be living on three, four times that a month. And it was just getting wasted. It was just, my lifestyle hasn't changed now that I do have a fixed budget. And that this is obviously last year's budget. This year it's changed again. And the reason I say I was a good example a month ago versus now is that uh, f three weeks ago, I just paid cash for a new BMW. So <laughs> I've, I've, just, awesome. I've just, I've just scuppered the, the, the uh, me being conservative uh, with the, the cash flow from the business so far this year uh, on that example. But what, if, if we are earning to say a round number, a hundred grand a year, what should we be targeting as our monthly spending rate? And obviously this depends whether you've got kids, whether you've already got a big mortgage, whether you've got car payments. I appreciate all that. But is there a round number? Is there a percent? Is Should we be spending a percentage of what we earn and saving or investing a percentage of what we earn as well? Well, there, there are lots of budgeting philosophies. You know, there's, there's a 50, 30, 20 philosophy where 50% of your budget should be on your living expenses. 30% um, is to kind of every, living expenses being your home, your fixed expenses, I would say, your mortgage, your car payment, those kinds of things. 30% um, goes to debt repayment. And then 20% is for savings. I try to stretch. I mean, I, I heard one uh, speaker at one point say, imagine if you could live on 10% of your income and invest 90% of your income. You know, what what kind of lifestyle could you create if you were to do that? And we're we are by no means near the 10% mark, but I bet we live on 30 to 40% of what we make. And the other 60% goes to um, either blast away debt or build for the future. And we do it very strategically. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who are probably doing right when it comes to their financial planners advice, where they're, they're putting a little bit, they dollar cost average, they put a little bit in the stock market on a regular basis. And, you know, when it's down, they're buying more. And when it's high, they buy less. But overall, it's kind of averaging, trending up. We do it a little bit differently. We we want to go at certain things like a laser beam. So when we went after debt, we went after debt like a laser beam and got rid of all of it within about two years. And then we had all this extra revenue that we would then put into real estate. So we might buy a property at a time, blast through that mortgage, and then have more cash flow on that property. And then we would start playing with the equity in those properties where we would leverage the property and invest more. But it seemed like a game for me. It was, it was like, how fast can I fill the bucket up and then drain the bucket? Fill the bucket up, drain the bucket. Or there's a lot of people out there will have six or seven or 10 buckets and they're putting a little bit in each one every month and they never really feel like they're getting anywhere. And I think for salespeople, we like some immediate gratification, you know, and particularly, particularly B2B where you're, you've got big sales, they may have a long sales cycle. Um, I think we need quick wins and this system allows you to have some really quick wins with your money. So you're, you're hitting loads of buttons for me here. Adam, and one thing that I want to do before the end of the year, may not may or may not happen, but from profit from the business and a product that we're launching, which I kind of touched on before we click record, which as this episode is out, should be out there and should be <laughs> hopefully is in the is in the, the hands of the audience at this point. But I want to use that revenue as a separate stream revenue coming to the business to buy a property before the end of the year, rental property, so I can video and, and record and document the process of going from kind of one income stream in the podcast into multiple income streams and investments and, and share that with the audience because my dad's done it and he, he doesn't listen to the show so I can say what I want about him, but he's bright, but he's no genius. <laughs> and you know, he's only ever had, he's, he's never earned a hundred grand a year in his roles. He's always middle management in manufacturing companies here in the UK sure. and he's an engineer by trade, but he's done this and he's further ahead than people I see who have hundreds of thousands coming in and they've got maybe they have a nice pension, but they don't have any resilience if that pension was for some reason, the government weren't to back it, if there was some problem down the further, line, further down the line, or if people are striving for early retirement, which is something I want to touch on as well with you. Should we be, should we be avoiding this advice of 50, 30, 20, or whatever the aggregation of numbers are? And should we be all in on early retirement, all in on uh, semi-retirement through owning a bunch of rental property, all in on clearly, uh, as we record this in 2017, there's a stock market crash coming at some point in the not too distant future, having a, a ton of cash ready to throw into that space to, to multiply very quickly. Should Is that the advice to someone who is a B2B sales professional? They have this opportunity to drive revenue and 
I know for me, if I was to have one goal of buy two houses this year, it's going to cost, it's going to need a hundred grand cash to do it, whatever the numbers are, kind of, uh, the numbers are irrelevant. That'll make me work harder in my sales job to hit those numbers versus I'm just going to put 20% away. Is that what we should be thinking about? Is that is that the quickest way to financial success by going all in on these things? I believe so. Um, and, and you know, there there's a part of me too, as I answer that, Will, that's maybe being a little inauthentic because I have I have five projects going at once and they're all getting about 20 to 25 percent of my energy. So that's probably not, you know, that that toes the line a bit of of what you're asking me. But I think that going all in on at least some side income projects is really important. I have a lot of folks in my circle that they have financially independent retire early as their their goal. You know, they're in the fire, the fire movement. And um, the issue with that is many of them are building side incomes and they're building it through blogs. They're building it through uh, digital courses. They're buying properties. They're, you know, they're uh, they're doing all sorts of different avenues to, to build it. Some are writing books and just creating passive income streams on Amazon for their book series, you know. So we're in this crazy age where you don't need one job. I mean, it's nice to have a job and a pension and all of that. That would be wonderful. But they're they're few and far between in the States today. Um, I think it's necessary and and I dare say even critical for people today to have something else on the side that at least fires them up and gives them something to do besides going home and watching reality television. Um, but so let, me, that's let a- me just challenge you on this slightly, Adam, because I think yeah. um, B2B sales is perhaps a, a caveat to this in that lot well every job that i've had in b2b sales has been uncapped you could earn unlimited revenue so for me the best investment of my time in 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 hindsight clearly i didn't do this five years ago when i should have and could have (laughs) it's only from interviews like this and and speaking and and having mentors and doing the show for so long that all this is is, there's no genius on my side it's all just been uh by osmosis of speaking to the experts like yourself but tell me if i'm right or wrong here b2b salespeople who perhaps have an uncapped commission is it not more efficient for them to, rather than having a side hustle, to be spending all their time on that B2B sales role, bringing in as much as possible because that's what they're an expert in that domain in versus trying to do coaching, training or anything on the side, write books. and But then invest that, the side hustle is the investment as opposed to a separate business. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And in fact, it fits kind of closely with with a, a strategy or a theory I heard that I really like. And it, and it was that if, that at some point in your life, you have to pursue mastery in something. And that if you're pursuing mastery in something, you'll get better and better, be worth more per hour, et cetera, et cetera. I think business to business salespeople, if they are truly, you know, 100% committed to making the most amount of money they can, it's about figuring out how much can you make per hour, per day, per deal, per month, per year, and focus on how do you get better and better and better at that. And in my own life, well, that was like that came kind of smacked me in the face at one point where I, I make, you know, really good money per hour as a speaker. And I go out and I'll do keynote events and associations and trade groups and those kinds of things. Um, and I kept talking to some of my friends who, who were making, you know, two and three times, four times what I was as a speaker. And I would say to them, well, what is it? Why am I not there? And they said, you're you're studying some of the wrong things. Like if you're trying to pursue mastery in this particular industry, come study with some of us that are pursuing this other angle where we can make, you know, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars for an engagement. And um, and so I've done that. You know, I've started going down a path where my pursuit of mastery is in different avenues and angles. Um, I think we're kind of talking the same thing in that the goal for any salesman should be figuring out what is the highest leverage point you have and how are you going after that and pursuing mastery in it to get even better. Um, you know, it's Tim Ferriss, it's the 80, 20 rule. And, um, and, and for me, it's constantly redefining and focusing on what is that 20% for me? What do I do better than anyone else? And how do I go do more of that at a higher clip? So this, this is going to be counterintuitive to what you just said, but I think it still fits in the same kind of bucket. So if we're aiming for mastery, uh, potentially, and there's, there's a whole bunch of salespeople listening to this now, and I was probably in this bucket of, I would I would strive for mastery in sales, not because I loved it, but because it was the highest leverage point of my time versus income. 
without the risk of running a business. Clearly, I've turned that on its head in the past couple of years. Um, but strategically, I could earn more money with less risk in a B2B sales role than anything else. So that's, that's in, in hindsight, that's why I was in sales. I didn't necessarily realize it at the time. I fell into it in that I can talk to people, I can be confident, I can um, influence, I can persuade. I loved the medical devices that I was selling. It was super interested in all of that and could geek out of all these surgeons. But the underlying thing that kept me in it was my ability to close deals and win business uh, in a short amount of time relative to all my friends who had office jobs, to my friends who, so my girlfriend's a doctor, she's at medical school. She, uh, she, she, she was at medical school when I met her. Obviously, she was, she was earning minus cash at that point from having not so much in, as in the US, but having student debt, student loans and things here in the UK. Um, she's now getting up on the pay scales, but I'm still ahead of her and it will take her a while. It, 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 n not even necessarily considering all the debt and everything else that's pulling her back as well. It'll take a while to catch up, um, kind of no matter what she does in medicine versus sales immediately. If you're good at it, you get that reward. Where I'm going with this is talking about mastery. Clearly, if you're a master salesperson, whatever that means, if you can hit target regularly and you've done that for a decade, you're never going to be short of a job. There's always going to be companies that are going to hire you. How do we how do we hold that in one hand? And then on the other end, I I value retirement, early retirement, financially dependent, so so important on this side. Should we do we need to get to mastery to shortcut the path to financial independence? Is that the quickest path to it? Or again, is it going for multiple jobs, multiple roles? Um, I'm kind of asking you 15 questions in one here, and I appreciate that, Adam. But is is that the shortcut? Is mastery the shortcut to becoming financially independent? Well, here's what's interesting. I almost think the answer to that question is is pursuing mastery. You, if you're a master salesperson, again, whatever that means, in your industry, you've hit target, you've you've made your goals, you've made you know significant revenue. Um, the next step may be to pursue mastery of money, and and for me, that was early on. That's what I wanted was how do I pursue mastery of money, where I understand every facet of the dollar and how it works. And when invested, whether it's in real estate or gold or silver or uh, options or whatever, how do I know that I'm doing the right thing? And so I, I would say, and I would throw this out maybe as a suggestion for, for some of your salespeople that listen to this, that, that love their jobs, can't imagine not selling what they sell or being in a sales role, but maybe, and this is where I find people, they make really good money. they they built a lifestyle that they like, they, they can afford and, and they're putting money away, but they're not sure it's enough. Like they're not sure that what they're doing is as much as they could be doing. I would encourage you to begin pursuing the mastery of money, meaning, you know, you're trusting someone to, to maybe manage and, and grow that for you. Um, but in the United States, it takes two years to get a massage therapist license. It takes six months to get a financial planning license. So, we, we have a lot of people who they have a great idea. Um, maybe they think they're genius at at the, the stock market, but in reality, they're just following the herd. You know, they're doing whatever their bosses are telling them to do, and maybe they don't know. So I think we got to take our, our money in our own hands to a certain extent and know that we're doing what we need to do. And you brought it up, you know, if, if and when the stock market collapses, how many people have? two to $500,000 in cash sitting on the sidelines accessible to them that they could dump into, you know, a stock that's typically a, a, a very steady eddy that's just going to get hammered by a down market. For context here on this, as you, as you mentioned it then, if we did have, we'll use a round number for, <laughs> for easy maths on my, heart, on my behalf, of if we had a hundred grand cash in the bank, we knew what we're doing, we'd mastered um, money in that we'd, we'd worked with yourself, Adam, we'd read... Tony Robbins' recent books on the subject. We've read, um, what's the one that I always go back to? The, the Millionaire Next Door. That really changed my thoughts on things. And perhaps we'll touch on that in a second. If we had 100 grand cash, what would, um, and the, the market took a huge dive. It was another um, kind of 2008. What kind of returns would you expect-ish on this 100 grand? What, what's the upside of right now spending six months, 12 months, reading all these books and learning about the markets? What's the upside for us from that 100 grand investment? Well, interesting, <clears throat> interesting that you bring it up because I, I just recently came back from a conference uh, that was put on by Phil Town, who wrote a book called Rule One Investing. 
And Phil Town's book is all about um, how if you if you know that you can buy a ten dollar bill for five dollars, you'll never ever lose money. And he maintains that as as you start investing in stocks, if that's what your game is, that you really only have to have an eye on four or five main stocks. And if those four or five do what you think they could do, you could retire a multimillionaire for the rest of your life. And he uses Warren Buffett as a great example. You know, Warren Buffett bought Coca-Cola back in the what late 80s or 90s. And by 2005, the dividends from his stock were more than what he paid for the stock. And so that's the kind of play that, that we're looking for, I think, ideally. So let me give you a real life example. Wells Fargo, which is in my backyard here, I'm in West Des Moines, Iowa, which is where Wells Fargo is based, largest mortgage company, certainly in the United States, maybe in the world, I don't know, but they, um, uh, their stock in 2008 was at $7 a share. It's currently trading at about $50 a share. So someone that goes in, you're asking about what kind of return, 400%, you know, I'm, I mean, we could get a massive, massive return on some of these stocks if if we're savvy enough about them and know what to expect when the market turns. And that is, again, I just really want to drill this into the audience because th this is part of my game plan. This is the business is driving revenue. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm launching this product, which should be out for the audience to pick up. And this is a second revenue stream just to, the whole point of this, and I'm going to document it all, is that is just cash. It's taking a sudden load of work to put it out there. But when that product's out there and, it, and it's and people are buying it, that cash is just going to be to experiment, to document, to hopefully share with the audience what they should, shouldn't, in my experience on investing from, from a real life perspective. Um, so with all that said, I want to drill into the audience. This is saving, what, a grand a month, $800 a month for 10 years, you put that into this one moment that probably is going to two or three downturns in your lifetime in the stock market. You put it in that moment and then that's essentially semi-retirement right there in a nice little package for you, right? Right, exactly. Uh, Warren Buffett has this great comment. He said, when gold falls from the sky, you can either go out and, and collect it with a thimble or a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and, and I think that, uh, you know, particularly for salespeople, uh, and I've, I've been in this in this game for a long time. I know that when I got a big fat commission check, my first inclination was, cool, I'm gonna get new threads, I'm gonna get, uh, I'm gonna get, pick out the car I want, I'm gonna buy. And, and there was sort of this goal of lifestyling up every time. And I maintain that whole idea of building a bigger life, not a bigger lifestyle means that you're okay with the lifestyle you're living and maybe incremental changes in that so that you can set aside massive amounts of money so that when a downturn like this happens, you're well positioned to just go all in, as opposed to those that are, you know, they're really happy with their very expensive luxuries, but have no money to, to put into opportunities that come along like this, that, that, you know, in all honesty, don't require a lot of management, you know, much like tenants and properties do. This is, you go in and, and you, you know, you watch it, but um, obviously you're watching it go up or hopefully watching it go up over time. And clearly there's <laughs> asterisks here. There's clearly risk of all of this as well of there's there's plenty of opportunity for whatever. And I don't, I'm only scratching the surface of my knowledge. I'm sure you know a lot deeper, but there's there's plenty of opportunity for the next financial crash to be a real shit storm versus the last one where here in the UK, the government propped up all the banks, they bailed everyone out. Whether that happens again, it probably will, in which case the next financial crisis will be an even more ridiculous one. And then we might be, kind of living on the brink of a zombie apocalypse. Or, <laughs> or, and, and there's stuff like that that's coming along, right? We're, we're kind of way overdue for multiple volcanoes in the US. Um, what's the big national park that's based on top of one volcano? And if that goes off, it's going to shroud the world in all kinds of crazy volcanic clouds and affect the economy in an instant. There's all kinds of things that it's very difficult to hedge against. But I, the point that I just want to get to the audience, and I'm sure you agree with this, is if you've got that cash in the bank versus you've done what I've done and bought a nice new BMW, if you've got that cash in the bank, you can leverage these opportunities and ride on them and benefit from them versus there's a huge financial crash. You get let your job gets kind of it disappears overnight because the, the, the bank you're working for collapses. The company that you're working for relies on uh, loans from the bank to operate. They've been operating in debt for too long and that collapses. So you lose your role. It turns all this, how to describe it. It's almost, it turns a negative situation in, if you've got cash in the bank or if you've got liquid assets, it turns it into a positive, right? You're hedging your bets here. You can plod along and do well in your sales role 
and live your lifestyle and have success. But that cash in the bank offsets any huge downturns in the in the sales industry, in industry in general, right? Right, exactly. I, you know, the way I would describe that too, Will, is having a much more future-oriented outlook as opposed to sort of an immediate outlook. And I think as as salespeople, um, and I've, I've been around, you know, I have so many friends that are just brilliant at sales and they have this sort of casual devil may care attitude about I'll, I'll always have a job. I mean, I, every salesperson is always going to be employed somewhere and I'll be fine. And so as a result, we tend to spend what we make because it's easy to make it. And, you know, I, I, I like that. I appreciate that mindset. I live in an abundant mindset, I think, most of the time where it's like money is free flowing and there's four trillion dollars circulating our globe every day. Our job is just to get a little piece of it every single day. Um, I think we have to have a future outlook and the future outlook, as you mentioned, in the the near term, the you know one to five year term may not be as rosy as what it had been in the past. And I think we have to plan for that right now, knowing that you know, I want my kids and my grandkids, and my great grandkids to live an amazing life. And so some of the money moves that I make to, to wrap this all up and kind of put a nice bow on it. Part of the reason I have this long term vision is I want my future generations to live excellent lives. And I want to teach them what I know in terms of the pursuit of mastery of money. And it only takes two generations to create a Rockefeller type fortune. So to the salespeople listening out there, are you generation one or are you generation two? You know, and if, if you're generation one, it's time to, you know, dig in your heels and start making some some moves for your family. Um, if you're generation two, congratulations, your parents were incredibly savvy people. Um, but I think that takes a long term outlook. Like I'm talking 50, 100 year outlook of what your, you know, your your future, your family tree looks like. And there's plenty of data on all this, isn't there? It's not like it's not like we're making this up or it's anecdotal. And I'll go back to, and um, t- tell me if you read it, but you, I assume everyone uh, in the kind of financial space in the, the market space has of a millionaire next door. Mm-hmm. So that just as a quick overview, I highly recommend the audience pick it up and it changed my opinion on things. And it, it uses doctors as an example. And as I mentioned before, my, my missus is a, is a doctor. So I tell her about this and she just shrugs it off. But essentially they, they polled, thousands of people and they wanted to suss out who the millionaires were because they wanted to sell them some financial product or, or whatever it was that they were the research had paid for on the back of. And what they found was the millionaires were not the people that they expected them to be. It was the the people who were driving a pickup, who had a small business, who'd been in business for 10, 15 years. It wasn't the the doctors, the surgeons, the high flyers, the bankers, the people with all the flashy cars. They were spending all that they got each month and then a little bit more on going into debt to keep up appearances, right? Right. So if we know, and I think we know this as well. I think we know when someone's buying a new car to show off, they've just bought a new house to keep up with the Joneses. They've just paid, one of my dad's friends just paid 20 grand to change the color of the tiles on his roof. And he's successful in what he does. Um, but I look at that, I'm like, well, <laughs> maybe that's something for your kids or your grandkids or something further down the line and just suck it up that you don't like the tiles on the roof. But, you know, right. obviously there's personal personal preference and, and whatever he, whatever he's into is fair enough because he works hard for his cash as well. How do we instill this though? Because it's one thing to say, right, if we spend 20% of our income, invest the rest, we'll be a millionaire in 15 years and we can then just choose the jobs that we work. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to implement it. Are there any practical ways that we can enforce this, not necessarily spending a percentage of our cash, but enforce this um, this this lack of lifestyle creep of, oh, Johnny, he works in the same role as me. He hit a target and he just bought himself a Porsche or Sarah's just done this and she just treated herself to something. How do we shut off those? How do we put blinders up to that and focus on ourselves as opposed to being almost manipulated by advertising society and the people around us? Well, I think, again, it goes to what's the future vision? Um you know, do you project out 20 or 30 years and see yourself as a 55 or 58 year old medical device salesperson and loving what you do still? And, and if you don't, what are you doing to set yourself up so that you, you don't have that situation? Um, I think that's one. Number two, I'm a fan of mini retirements. You know, one of the books that 
that I read that I loved was the was uh, the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And he talked about many retirements that people take should be taking these on a regular basis. And so for us, you know, one of the things we did was we said we want um, we want X as a net worth an X amount in these various accounts. And once we hit that, then we're going to take two months and we're going to go we're going to uh, rent a villa on the Amalfi Coast in Italy and take our kids for the summer and just go and, and immerse ourselves in Italian culture. So when we hit those numbers, then we start planning on it. And we're, this is actually happening next summer. And so, Congratulations. yeah, thank you. And, and it's cool because we knew we had a goal. We knew what we wanted to do to achieve that goal. And for us in building a bigger life, not a bigger lifestyle, the life is really about experience. Lifestyle is about stuff. And in my estimation and the people that I've been around, the folks that are far more interesting to me have really great experiences. The folks that aren't that interesting to me have really great stuff, you know? And so I, 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 I sort of prize experience over stuff by and large. And that's just sort of how we've raised our kids that they don't, they don't want stuff. They want to go do things. They want to have fun experiences, but they don't need the latest knickknack or video game or Nerf gun or whatever. They're just, they're okay with having experiences. And so I think it's, it's twofold. It's having a long-term vision about what are you doing to set yourself up for that? And number two, it's about setting goals in place. And then when you hit those goals, celebrate by giving yourself the, the experiences that you've always wanted. And I think this might be, this might be something that the audience haven't thought about before, but if you are a real high performing member of your sales team, if you say to your boss in three years time, I want to achieve this. I want to smash my targets. I want to smash my goals. And then in three years time, or you know, whatever the number is, I want to take six weeks off to travel to Australia and go and hang out with a load of girl in bikinis and learn to surf. They're going to, they're going to agree to that because the work that you put in in the meantime, the revenue that you'll bring in to achieve that goal is way worth kind of six weeks, a month and a half off in their mind. And they can strategize, they can make it, they can pull in the extra resources, they can make that sabbatical happen for you. And that's, it's almost as I'm, I'm I'm processing this as I go through it because I've always had this goal. I think I've shared it on the show before that I'm going to do a thousand episodes of this podcast. Come hell or high water, come the fact that no one listens to it anymore, I will get through a thousand episodes because I I take so much away from this show and hopefully the audience are learning along with me. But I take so much from this these episodes that it's it's a development for myself. So even if I was earning zero cash from it, it's still net positive for me and future businesses, future sales roles, anything that I do after this point. So as, as we're just saying this, and as you're saying this and, and sharing it with us, Adam, I'm almost feeling like I should make a public goal of after a thousand episodes, and we're, I've recorded about 400 so far, after about a thousand episodes, perhaps I should take six weeks off and go do something. Because that, as I'm saying it, I'm getting excited. That would motivate me to hustle and get all this done. And for me, directly, the number of episodes I put out, because we charge ad rates on a CPM per thousand download basis that leads to more revenue so is this something that we should all be thinking about whether we are in a traditional corporate role or not i think it absolutely is and candidly i think that more corporations should be instilling this as part of their culture you know saying what what would be your big hairy audacious goal numbers wise and if you hit it what would you like to do with six weeks off if i were to give you six weeks contiguous you know um and then maybe even the companies would say, we'll even pay for it. So you want to go to Australia? We'll cover your cost to go to Australia. I mean, if they're bringing in millions of dollars, why wouldn't a company do it, right? To hit some super stretch goal. That makes total sense of, because that would motivate you more than, yeah, you may get a Rolex, you may go on some uh, kind of, whatever they call it, kind of uh, CEO meetup, holiday lunch or whatever it is. If you choose the end target from the UK, it's going to cost say 1500 quid for flights say it costs another couple of grand for a reasonable hotel for that period. And then the salesperson just spends what they want on boozing, partying or gambling or whatever they want, <laughs> whatever else they want to do <laughs> over there. It, it, it's probably a cheaper, it's probably a cheaper promotion than the, the stereotype of the Rolex at the end of the year or things like this. For sure. Uh, I, and I, you know, it's, it goes back to basic motivation, right? I think if salespeople are motivated by money, there's got to be something else too that you're motivated. What does the money get you? And if it's just the stuff, for some that may be enough. But if for some, I think it's got to be time off or whatever it may be. Everything that I've read in the pursuit of mastery um, goes back to 
self-care and self-development and all of that. And I, you know, this may be a little off topic, but I think if we're not taking time for self-development and self-care as salespeople, we'll burn out really quickly. And so some of that maybe is built into this six week sabbatical or two month sabbatical. I think we're on to something, Will. It makes total sense. I think, uh, yeah, hopefully there's some sales leaders that are listening to this that can experiment with this and let us know how it goes. I'm happy to hear that feedback. And and uh, if there's a sales leader listening who does this, drop me an email, will at salesmanpodcast.com because that's an episode in itself of how to motivate a sales team and then how salespeople can do that to leverage themselves. And if you're having success in this, we'll have you on the show and we'll have a chat about it. So with that, Adam, I want to, we kind of talked we talked widely about the subject here. I want to get real practical for a moment. So you've given us some potential numbers to be heading to of spending versus saving. We've talked about the very practical aspect. And I think you have to do this consciously. I don't think this just happens by itself. I think you have to consciously avoid lifestyle creep. You have to consciously get to a point where you're happy and probably hustle to get to that point. And then understand that that extra 20 grand you spend. So I just bought a BMW M235i. I got it used approved. I think it's about 23 grand. The M2, which is the hot hot version of it, was about forty grand, and there's definitely not twenty grand's worth of um, enjoyment of going from one. To, it's the same engine in both of them, same brakes, and a whole bunch of other things as well. So, I consciously bought that one, knowing that I'm not going to get twenty grand's more joy out of the the hotter version of it. So we have to consciously go through this process, and it's something that we have to take emotion out of. Perhaps, what practically should we be doing each month to track all of this and track our process? Should we be treating our financial income, income like a business? Should we have a profit and loss spreadsheet that we do every month? Should we be hustling to say, well, I want to keep my spend at three grand a month and I'm going to increase it to six grand a month by the end of the year by doing X, Y, Z. How do we, because uh, I'm analytical here, so I need help, I need spreadsheets, I need paper, I need post-it notes in places to keep me motivated. What do we need to do to make everything that we've talked about happen? I think... Number one, it's understanding that your income is either efficient or inefficient, okay? And so the the numbers that we're talking about really, they boil down to four things. So your income should do one of four things. It should pay your expenses, which it does for most people. It should decrease debt, which it does not do for most people. They pay their payment, but it doesn't decrease it that much. Um, it should increase wealth. So you're investing and putting it in uh, in investment kind of accounts. And the last is you should do good or have fun, right? They're kind of hand in hand, do good, have fun. For most people, they pay, they pay expenses and they have fun. That's all they do with their money. And, and they don't really decrease debt and they may not really increase wealth more than what their traditional, uh, you know, their, their retirement contributions are. So I think part of it is looking at maybe your net worth numbers every single month and watching those creep up. And specifically, I look, I would give you maybe two or three metrics to focus on. Well, one is net worth. So overall, how much are, are you worth in the market? Number two, um, I think it's the amount of debt you're carrying, which should be going down on a monthly basis. And number three, it's the amount of debt payments per, uh, per month in, in relative to your income. So if you have $3,000 a month in debt payments on $8,000 in income, um, or let's say 10,000 for easy math, 30% of your payments go towards debt repayment. Well, what if you could blast away whatever you have in debt so that you have that extra 3,000 and, or, or maybe even your payments get shrunk down to 10% of your income is in debt repay, is in debt payments. That's sort of the goal for me is how much of my income is actually mine to keep at the end of the month versus me giving to someone else for, for the privilege of having bought something I couldn't necessarily afford in the first place. Makes total sense. I've got two questions for you here. You may or may not know this off the top of your head. What is the average amount of debt? And then a follow on to that of, should we have, other than perhaps your mortgage, should we have no debt? Should we not have credit card debt at all? I'm lucky in that I've, I, maybe it was an upbringing thing. I don't know what it was, but I've, I've never bought anything on credit. To, to the detriment of I've probably got a really shit credit rating because I've never used it. <laughs> <laughs> probably something I need to work on in the future from that perspective. You're paying cash for cars. You're, yeah. yeah, yeah, you, and yeah. It's, I, I said, I don't know if it's the way I've been brought up. I don't know whether it is a, a, a something that's been instilled to me through business ventures of seeing other people's businesses collapse because they were reliant on other people's money. 
uh, it might just be that I'm too scared to give away things and I need to have ownership of it, which is, is a problem when you're trying to network and build a business as well. So do you know what the average debt is? So we can just, we can, we can see where we are in the mix and, and should we be, should the goal to have no debt? Should the goal be to have no debt? Well, the average family in America has 16 over $16,000 in credit card debt. Um, I was like you, I, I was kind of raised in a family where, um, we did not have a lot of debt of credit card debt. That was not something that, that we were brought up believing. Um, I think that folks that are in higher income positions, and I'm, I'm going to speak with a really broad brush generality here, but I think people who make a lot of money and who know that there's every two weeks, they're going to get a fat paycheck and it's going to be more than what they need. So they're okay putting stuff on credit card, but it gets to the point where you have no idea how much you've spent over a month. And then you get the bill and it's like, Oh shit, this is more than <laughs> I thought it was going to be. Um, in, in general, I think having none or using your credit card, but using it for the things you would normally spend money on during the month and then paying it off every month is, is critical. I mean, if you're going to build wealth, why send it to the credit card companies as opposed to sending it to your own pocket? The way that we do that is a little bit different. We, um, we put everything that we, buy throughout the month on a credit card, groceries, gas, things for our kids, um, clothing, you know, all that stuff goes on a credit card, um, including gym memberships, our security system, you know, monthly subscription, Netflix, all of that goes on the credit card. At the end of the month, we pay that credit card off with our home equity line of credit. And so our HELOC at home pays that whole thing off and it does it automatically. Whatever the balance is, it goes right to the HELOC. And then our income gets deposited into the HELOC and always pays the HELOC down to zero. So there's room left on the HELOC that we then use to pay down our principal mortgage, whether it's on our home or on a rental property or what have you. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of the, the efficiency of money is do you have a automated system of how your income flows in and pays things off so that you know that you're getting all four of those paying expenses um, decreasing debt, increasing wealth and doing good and having fun. Got it. So we need a system. We don't want to be at the end of the month making all these ad hoc choices of I've done well this month. I'm going to put two grand in this. I'm going to put four grand in that. You you want a system that takes all that away from you so that you can just, I guess, then you just focus on making more money. <laughs> that accelerates the whole process, right? Well, it's amazing. I would I would love to like send a survey to your listeners and say, what percent of your week is spent in financial concern? Call it concern. It's not worry necessarily. It's like, oh, I got to pay that or I've got this bill coming due or oh, I totally, totally forgot to put the license plate tags on my car or, or whatever it may be, pay property taxes. When those things are no longer there, it does free you up to be better at what you do on a daily basis. So I, it was amazing. My wife and I got to a point where we had three bills, three three bills that we had to write a check for everything else was automated. And, you know, now that's all an automatic bill pay. But when we got down to that point, it was like, I feel so free. We, we never sit down and talk about money because we just know it's all going where it needs to go. And it's a, it's a very like freeing, motivating thing to have that. Interesting. And as you say this, I've got a water bill on my desk. It's for hundred quid. There's clearly <laughs> more than enough money in the account to pay it. And I've been putting yeah. off paying it for, probably a month. It's probably been sat on my desk for a month just because it is, I know it's going to pull me away from doing all the podcasts and the content uh, and the business side of things. So I've just avoided doing it. But now it's sat there staring at me. Um, Yorkshire Water here in the UK. <laughs> they texted me the other day to chase me up for it as well. So I, I'm going to implement some of this. I'm going to listen back to this episode. And I've got one final question, Adam, and um, I'm conscious of time here. So I, and I'm putting you on the spot asking you this for facts and figures. So I appreciate if you don't know them off the top of your head. But net worth, what is a what is a strong net worth for someone? I guess you'd know this in the the data in the states more than anywhere else. But what what is a strong net worth for someone? Age irrelevant, kind of retirement irrelevant, job irrelevant. What is a number that you would look at and you'd go, oh, that person, that person has their shit together. What kind of number would would force you to think like that about someone? Well, the the the, the bigger number, and this is more like the retirement number. Um, today in the U S they're saying three to 4 million is what you need in net worth in order to be able to live the life that you probably have grown accustomed to, you know, assuming a 5% return and your, and your money grows and it'll be passed on to future generations. Um, 
I think for a, a young salesperson um, and, and young obviously is relative, right? I'm 42. So I, I, I even look at 60 now and it's like, well, that's not that old, you know, it's not that far away. But in my, you know, in my early thirties, I thought, oh, a million, I'm going to hit a million. It'll be really easy and this will be fun and no problem. Um, you know, if you're 30 and you're, you're, you're at even three to $500,000, you're on your way. It's the starting point. But I will tell you that once you get past those hurdles and you get above some of those numbers, it's, it's fun to watch it. I mean, it is fun to watch it go higher and higher and higher and know that for us, kind of our magic number is 10. And when, when that 10 million mark hits, it's like, all right, now what sky's the limit? What do we want to do? Where do we want to go? What do we want to, you know, what houses do we want to own if they're multiple or do we want to just vacation, you know, rent a place in San Diego for, for a year? Do we want to go to Europe and spend time in the Swiss Alps for six months? Like, what do we want to do? Um, and in the midst of that, as we hit milestones, we're going to take some of those micro uh, retirements, mini retirements. So we're going to reward ourselves along the way. But that's my number. You know, that's the, the one I'm shooting for. I know that if I aim for 10 and I hit four or five, by the time there's no more gas in my tank, I'm still going to live a pretty amazing life. You know, it's the lifestyle irrelevant at that point. I love this. Hopefully, a whole bunch of the audience went, oh, I'm, I'm not doing too bad here. And I know a whole ton of them went, oh, shit, I'm nowhere near any of this. And that hopefully was a kick in the ass because maybe we should have started the interview with that, Adam. Maybe we should have started the interview with the numbers that we should be aiming for because clearly we, we can reverse engineer. We can work backwards from that point. So maybe that's the starting point for anyone listening to this show who's going to pull up in the car uh, before they go into the office and scribble down some numbers and see where they're at with all of this. And I implore everyone to do that because you don't know. It sounds so crazy, but you don't know until you know, right? And... There's going to be so many, and I think, and, and I think the government, especially in the UK, are hinting at this as well. There's going to be so many people that don't have the baby boomers don't have enough money to retire in kind of our lifetime. Never mind us. That that's going to scupper what we're doing retirement and with healthcare and everything else as well. It might change the whole game. If you don't retire at 65, you retire at 85. I know salespeople that are 70 odd who could outsell me in an instant with no matter how technical the product is, and so. Perhaps the game and the world's going to change slightly as we go through this this process. But if we don't have a, an endpoint to aim for, how are we ever going to get there? And I, you know, what for what it's worth, I think maybe even giving some of your younger salespeople listeners a, a a goal or a target. If you are driving around your net worth, you know what I mean. Like you've spent more on your car than you actually have in investments or in your account. That's a problem. Um, and I think you need to shift your focus maybe to. How could you put away twenty thousand dollars? And if you can put away twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and and people will ask me, where do I put it? You put it in a money market account or a safe account. But this is your this is your opportunity fund that someday you'll grow this, and it's okay just to know that you you're able to put it aside. If you're one of those salespeople that's got a fairly decent net worth, let's say it's between five hundred and a million or more, but you're not putting forty or fifty thousand dollars away a year, make that your goal. Could you put 50 grand, could you add 50 grand to your net worth every year, add 10% to your net worth? Um, and if you can do that now, you know, now we're cranking, now you're going to double it every seven years. Yeah. You know, the rule of 72, you get 10%, seven years is about 72. It, your money will double every seven years. How many doublings can you do before now you're at that four or 10 million mark, whatever you want to be at? Which is crazy, right? It's almost the there's millions of cliches to describe this, but it's it's getting that ball moving. It's getting that momentum. And then that's when you get to live off the back of it when it's rolling on its own pace. And with that, Adam, we've put a lot of ground here, mate. We'll have to have you back on. So I feel like there's another layer of strategy that we could dive into and do a part two of this show and dive into even it's probably just some of the basics that we need to be doing each month, each year, and then how we document this moving forward. So we'll get into that if, if you're up for it in another episode. But with that, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show. So I know you're not a, a right now, you're not an out and out salesperson, but you'll have a, uh, you'll have a thought and opinion on this. I'm sure if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I would tell, uh, I would tell my, my past self, uh, one of the things that for me has has made head and shoulders difference is I started to understand people's psychology and their social style, the way they communicate. And there's a um, there's a group called Traycom and they have a product called Social Styles. 
And once I learned social styles, I could go into a room and say, that person's analytical, they want data. That person's a driver, they want bullet points. That person's an expressive, they're gonna share ideas and we need to go for a beer together. Um, and that person's an amiable, they'll nod their head and, and have fun and they want, they want me to ask them about their kids and their pet horse and everything else. <laughs> As a salesperson, if we don't know who we're dealing with and communicating the way they want to be communicated with, the, 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 the chance of losing the sale is very high. If you're communicating the way they want to be communicated to, you'll nail it every time. Amazing stuff. We'll link to that in the show notes to this episode over at salesandpodcast.com. And Adam, with that, tell us where we can find out more about you and for everyone who's super intrigued now and wants to get, the, get their shit together for once of a better way of describing it. Uh, tell us where we can find out more about you and everything that you do. You bet. So as I mentioned, my my speaking business is kind of my my main driver now. I'm teaching a lot. Uh, but you can find me at adamspeaks.com, uh, A-D-A-M-S-P-E-A-K-S.com. And then the, the mortgage system that we use, as I uh, talked about the strategy and how we use a HELOC and all of that, is a software that I ended up uh, creating and white labeling. Um, it's at shredmymortgage.com. So if you go to shredmymortgage.com, you can do a, an analysis of how much you have and how much you have on your mortgage and how quickly you could actually pay it off. It's incredibly fascinating. Um, so check those out, adamspeaks.com and shred my mortgage. Good stuff. Well, I'll link to both of them again in the show notes over at salesandpodcast.com. And with that, I didn't want to thank you for your time, your insights. I want to thank you for going back and forth and having a conversation about this as opposed to me just grilling you with questions because you're, you are throwing things at me and I'm clicking my fingers as I do this and it's sparking little things in my brain of what I need to do going back on this episode pay that yeah. sodding water bill is the first thing <laughs> and automate some of that so I appreciate that mate and I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast Hey my pleasure Will thanks for having me again I appreciate it 